Cho. Kevin is a professor and chairman of the Horticultural Sciences Department at the University of Florida. Welcome to the show, man. Yeah, hi, Marcus. Thank you for having me aboard. So before we get into our topic today, can you give folks a little bit of background on how you got into this field and the study of GMO specifically? Well, I, I started out when I was a little kid. I always was interested in DNA and always interested in uh, how things were inherited. And this kind of sounds strange that you're interested in these patterns even before you understand how you know how two organisms get together to share genetics. Um, I'm looking at these patterns and thinking about it. And my first book in recombinant DNA technology. Uh, came out of the library when I was 10. Wow. So I was very lucky. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> what a dork. Um, I was very lucky to uh, study that through high school and college, and even today still use recombinant DNA as part of our research program to understand how, how life ticks. That's really cool. So just for the folks that don't know, that aren't familiar with that term, can you just define it for us? Sure. So recombinant DNA is really the basis of being able to, well, colloquially referred to as like gene splicing, right? So this is the ability to take uh, DNA sequences from one organism and be able to change them or move them. Um, It's like the best example is when we uh, take the gene from a human for insulin and put this into bacteria and then have the bacteria grow lots and lots of human insulin. And this way, we're able to produce products using this recombinant DNA technology uh, that can really serve humans very well. Very cool, man. So can you tell us what exactly is the definition of a GMO? I don't think folks really understand what exactly it is. And then how is it classified? (laughs) Well, that's a tricky question because I don't think there's good consensus anywhere on what that really means. But the, the most suitable definition, the most common one, when we say GMO, we're talking about the recombinant DNA. We're talking about taking an organ, taking a gene from one organism and placing it into another, or even uh, changing a gene within an organism. So in other words, um, if we were to move that insulin gene from uh, humans to bacteria, people would say that bacterium is now a GMO, genetically modified organism. However, um, I think that you and I are both modifications of the genetics of our parents. So it depends on who you ask. And I think that's why we need to have very precise technology, a very precise terminology that if we talk about genetic engineering, that that seems to do it, that this is the very precise laboratory mediated way that we adjust genes in an organism. Okay, cool. So folks typically hear the words genetically modified or genetic engineering and then automatically associate that with something bad and then they hear the word natural and they automatically associate that with something good so assume these terms are like essentially complete opposites i think that's what people sort of think just on a general sense so can you let folks know why that might be misleading yeah it's misleading because genetic changes happen all the time that a great example is the sweet potato that the sweet potato has a natural insertion from a bacterium in its genome and you know you and i are a very large portion of our genomes or the genes on board are very similar to bacterial genes they're relics of evolution Um, we're very similar to a banana and extremely similar to chimpanzees so the idea of, of something having genes that are similar to between or shared between organisms isn't terribly unusual. The idea of natural, you know, the genetic variation is natural. You know, genetic change and mutation is natural. That many different organisms, especially plants, have thousands of different genetic elements that move around the cell and change the way genes are expressed and change the way genes are inherited. So this idea of uh, natural equating, you know, steady as it goes, no genetic change is really a misnomer. That uh, the most natural thing is genetic change. And that's what gives us the amazing variation and diversity we see in different organisms. Right. And then I guess you could, somebody could think about something like cyanide in an apple seed. You would think, hey, apples are natural, but Um, The poison is kind of in the dose, right? So how does that play into that natural phenomenon versus genetically engineered and all that sort of stuff? 
Yeah, that's a big one, too. All of this boils down to a fundamental problem with chemophobia, that people have been really scared to death about the science that's around them, whether it's chemistry or, or biology. And like you mentioned, you know, uh, seeds are naturally r rich in things like cyanide and other types of compounds, um, but very small doses. You have to eat a lot of it to get sick. In the African continent and in Asia, people eat cassava on a daily basis. It's like their potato. And cassava, if you eat it straight, is loaded with cyanide. You have to process it in specific ways. So nature isn't necessarily friendly. Nature produces lots of nasty compounds and, uh, you know, rabies and dog turds and all these other things that are not necessarily friendly compounds, right? So um, it's, it is an important nuance. And when we talk about genetic engineering, it really is a natural process. We are exploiting the bacterium that transfers genes as a nat natural part of its life cycle. We're just giving it different genes to transfer. Right. And I think a cool way for people to think about that, and I think I've heard you use this example, is like with plants and, and different things that can't necessarily run away or fight back, they have to have defense mechanisms in place in order to not go extinct. Is that correct? That's right. I mean, plants are elaborate collections of sensors. They understand what's happening in their environment. They understand where their neighbors are. They understand what insects are chewing on them and how to call in the predators that will come get them. Uh, plants are amazing. And so defense is a big part of that. You can't walk away from stress. So you have to stay and fight. And you use novel um, networks of genes to be able to do that. Amazing. Now, shifting gears a little bit, what does the term organic actually mean and how does that differ from quote unquote conventional when it comes to our produce and things like that? Sure. Well, that's really important. Organic has very specific meaning in the United States and each country has its own standards. And we have national organic standards, which means that the crops that are grown must be grown without the use of specific um, uh, synthetic uh, either fertilizers or insecticides, fungicides, and um, have to be grown on land which has been fallow for at least three years from any other uh, applications of agricultural chemistry. And, um, and uh, different types, of, those are the main standards for crops. It mostly has to do with agricultural inputs. So what you're using in terms of crop protection, so fungicides, insecticides, herbicides, things like that. But um, if you start talking about animals, there's other standards such as access to the outdoors, things like that. So in the U.S., does organic mean that people can't use, the farmers can't use pesticides, herbicides, fungicides, all that sort of stuff? Or is there just certain amounts that they can use or specific types? Yeah, it's just specific types. You have to resort to naturally occurring insecticides and naturally occurring um, uh, uh, herbicides and other compounds like that. So, um, for instance, you can use Bt, which is uh, something uh, bacteria um, bacteria produce this toxin that kills caterpillars. So you can take those bacteria and spray them on your organic plants all day. Nobody cares. Um, that's perfectly allowable within the standards. There are other compounds that also kill insects that can be used, uh, like uh, pyrethrins, which are a compound enriched in chrysanthemum uh, petals. These are perfectly allowable inside organic production. Now, what makes those compounds allowable versus others? Where's the distinction? How do they separate that? Yeah, and it, it's where it's because they are naturally produced. It doesn't take a chemical reaction outside of in a laboratory to be able to do it. It's the toxic chemicals that nature makes. And as we talked about earlier, you know, those abound. Plants make nasty chemicals to protect themselves from other organisms. And these are just some examples of making uh, chemical strategies to protect themselves from insects. Gotcha. Now, I think when people think about farmers spraying things like pesticides, that they're, you know, dousing their crops in 50 different types of chemicals, but that would not only be more expensive for the farmer, but not in their best interest. So what are farmers actually doing and how do they decide what and how much of these chemicals to use? Yeah, that's a big thing that we do in the universities is help farmers determine what those best management practices are. And it's what it is, is it boils down to a suite of integrated practices, such as when you plant and how you prepare the soil, uh, what you use for pre-emergent 
compounds to protect uh, the plants, um, how much you apply and when you apply. Here in the state of Florida, you think about fungicides, which people have really um, talked about things like strawberries and said, oh, they're so loaded with fungicides, the dirty dozen and all that stuff. But really what happens is uh, we know that the fungus, the fungus only grows during specific types of weather outbreaks. And so farmers have weather stations all around the state that monitor the weather. And if it looks like the right combination of heat and humidity and temperature are there, then uh, the farmer gets a text message to apply the fungicide. It's cut use of fungicide by something like um, 60 to 80 percent in the last few years. And when they're applying fungicide, it might be two ounces, two fluid ounces, uh, you know, a couple of milliliters over an acre. So it's tiny, tiny amounts of stuff because they're specifically made to kill a specific kinds of fungus. So it, it really is a question of using tiny amounts that are specific for that process because save money and save uh, environmental impact of farming. Right. That totally makes sense. Now, in a lot of people's eyes, the company Monsanto, it's almost like a four-letter word. It's just kind of pure evil to some folks. And, you know, they're putting out, putting farmers out of work, apparently, controlling seed distribution, et cetera, et cetera. Now, I'm sure not everything Monsanto does is amazing, but it all can't be bad either. So how should folks think about and sort of look at companies like this in a, a more balanced and unbiased way? Yeah, I think the best way to look at it is is that their clients are not you and me. Their clients are farmers. And if they're not doing the right thing for farmers by by selling a good product, uh, farmers won't buy it again. If they don't get good service, farmers won't buy it again. And there's a number of companies that are competing for farmer dollars. And so they have to they spend they spend their time trying to get farmers to buy their products. And it means they have to be performing well on the farm and safe for the humans downstream. If they're not, the farmer goes out of business. So that's really the best way to think about it, and that farmers continue to buy products like these every year, not just from Monsanto, but from all the companies that sell genetically engineered seed. And that's a pretty good indicator that they are a good quality product. They cost more, a lot more, than conventional seeds. And if they don't perform well, like they don't in some areas where we have some issues with them uh, culturally, um, farmers choose to use uh, non-GE seed, and, and they grow that just fine. Okay, cool. Now, you touched on this a little bit, but many folks have heard about the Clean 15 and the Dirty Dozen list. And I have to be honest, before I became aware of your work, I supported it without actually knowing a whole lot about it, which is you know, not the best. But you recently wrote an article titled A Half Dozen Reasons to Reject the Dirty Dozen. So can you explain some of the misconceptions you outlined in that article for us? Yes, it's absolutely important that we understand this. So the, that list is compiled by an organization called the Environmental Working Group. And I know these folks. I mean, I, I, I respect them in a lot of ways because they're sharp people who are interested in the environment. But this is very deceptive. They get the list from the USDA because the USDA routinely monitors fruits and vegetables to ensure that people are uh, following the guidelines for application of fungicides and insecticides. And the USDA does these surveys. Well, they publish these long lists of surveys saying, okay, 99% of what is being done out there is acceptable and in the windows where it's supposed to be. A tiny bit once in a while, we found a little bit higher here on celery. We found a little bit too high once in strawberry. Um, they, they give a good report. What EWG does is they say, okay, they detected residues, 50 different residues on the strawberry. Well, they were all well below limits, but they were detected, not all on one strawberry, but across all of the strawberries in the U.S. <laughs> yeah. And so they might, you know, strawberry farmers use a couple of different fungicides during the year, you know, maybe two or three, maybe an insecticide if they have to. And what EWG does is they'll say in the Dirty Dozen report, well, we detected 50 different compounds on strawberries. Well, not on one strawberry 
but on all of the strawberries across all of the different environments and all of the different fungus and all the different bacterial threats and all of the different insect threats. So what they do is they lump all of the information in the one place and say, look what a toxic soup this is, when really it's um, a, a very, very safe the report says very good things in general, not the Dirty Dozen report, the USDA data. And the problem with that is it scares people away from fruits and vegetables. And not everybody can afford organic fruits and vegetables. And it, what we know happens is it turns off the poorest people from eating a diet rich in fruits and vegetables. And that's just unacceptable. Right. Now, what were some of the other factors that were involved in that article that you think are worth mentioning to folks? That's an obvious one, right? Like, we definitely want to steer folks towards eating more fruits and veggies and not, you know, I think an important question to ask is what's the alternative? Yeah. Like, if somebody's going to stop eating fruits and veggies and then it's like because there's, you know, pesticides or something on it and then they go and run through a fast food joint instead. I mean, that's a, that's a net loss, right? Right, and that's exactly what happens. Um, those studies have been done, not necessarily with the Dirty Dozen, but with food labels, where they've uh, actually labeled, um, uh, done the experiment of taking very cheap milk and calling it milk, and then one that's a few dollars more and putting gluten-free. Sure. Now, there's no gluten in milk anywhere, but what people will do is they'll see that label and think, okay, this is a warning label that tells me that there's something in this milk that's bad for me. And I don't know what gluten is, but I heard about it before. It must be bad stuff. So what it means is that the people who can't afford the expensive milk now just don't buy milk at all. They go buy Mountain Dew, uh, which you can buy real cheap. You know, you see what I mean. It, it's just a way that it really keeps people away from eating the things that are best for them. Yeah, that's a great point, man. Now, I can kind of hear folks saying, why would the EWG use those kind of scare tactics or promote false info like this. So what would be the motivation factors of a company like that in this instance? Well, I, I'm not exactly, I think what EWG does is they're really interested in environmental causes. Now they're also against vaccines and also against cell phones. So these are folks who tend to um, uh, be very far on the fringe with respect to environmental issues, which I applaud in a lot of ways. The problem is well, the thing that helps them is that fundraising is great when you do it around food. And Greenpeace has known that for a long time, so have many other organizations, because food is so important to us culturally and socially, and so important for us, our daily sustenance, that it's easy to scare people into decisions around food, um, whereas, you know, save the whales doesn't make people move like it used to. Um, stop feeding your kids you know, herbicides does still resonate, maybe more than ever. So that's why they lean on that one more than any other. Gotcha. Now, we clearly use this chemistry for a reason. So what are some of the benefits of genetically modified pr food production? And then how are we managing the potential risk from a health and consumption angle? Well, sure. The, the, the best angle, so when we talk about genetic engineering, we really are stuck with just three main traits that we find in crops. And the main one is this uh, insect resistance trait. And it uses that same Bt protein, which is used in organic production as a whole bacterium. It takes the gene out of the bacterium, puts it into the plant. And now the plant makes this protein that affects only specific insects. It doesn't even affect all insects, let alone animals, perfectly safe for us. But the use of that gene in corn, in cotton, um, and, uh, and a few other things, uh, in India, or in Bangladesh, rather, inside the eggplant, inside the brinjal, it's cut insect insecticide use dramatically, um, probably in the states between 30 and 80 percent, depending upon where you live and the type of crop and the weather and insect pressure. But in Bangladesh, the eggplants that used to require 100 sprays per season now require two. And it's just a huge win for the environment. The other main trait is herbicide resistance, where you can spray, you can plant, say, uh, corn or soy, uh, let it grow for a few weeks, and then start to see it come up out of the ground, along with all the weeds. Then you spray the herbicide over the top, 
and this is a small amount of something called glyphosate. You use about 750 milliliters or two pop cans per acre. And uh, it kills the weeds and leaves the plants. So farmers don't have to till and they don't have to spray other chemicals like atrazine or other old school herbicides. The advantage there is that glyphosate is a very low toxicity herbicide that uh, works used to work very well on many weeds, but um, not so great on all of them anymore. Okay. Now we're kind of in a funny spot right now where it seems sort of like the public just doesn't know who or what to trust when it comes to all this stuff. And we're emotional creatures by nature and having a scientific outlook is kind of counterintuitive in a sense. So how do you recommend folks navigate the information on GMOs and then also just topics like this moving forward and where should they look for trusted sources essentially? Yeah, that's really tough because there's so many places online that appear to be trusted sources. Like you'll see something called the Institute for Responsible Technology, you know, and it really is a broom closet um, and a in a kind of a front for a guy who sells books and documentaries telling you how your food is killing you. Um, this, the best information comes from university scientists, but also from the National Academy of Science. National Academy of Science is uh, where the the elite. Um, brains of, of the U.S. And, and other places are, are part of this organization. And, um, and it, it's very difficult to get into the academy, and the academy provides a synthesis of major hot-button issues like um, climate change or genetic engineering. And they come up with a synthesis, and it's very sober, very even-handed. Maybe a lot of scientists argue maybe too even-handed, that it's a little bit too soft. It doesn't come out swinging enough. Um, but uh, that's a great place. And if you look online at National Academies, uh, I don't have the URL in front of me, but they call it a, re- a report on genetic engineering and crops. Really good. The website GMOAnswers.com is good. It is an industry-funded website, but even though it's funded by industry, most of the people who write for them are independent scientists, some from industry. But what makes that important is that the information is in one place and is vetted by multiple people. If something there is false, I would point it out in a minute. And so we, we treat that very uh, carefully as a very valuable resource and ensure that that information is true because it needs to be scientifically vetted. Those are two great places, a sense about science, uh, Farmers and Ranchers Alliance. There's a lot of good places and, and the list is only growing. Awesome, man. Now, I'm glad you mentioned that around funding because some folks as a rebuttal to certain science will say, well, if X, Y, or Z funded this study, then it's you know funded by industry and therefore produced a favorable outcome and, and now becomes invalid. So can you tell us why this isn't a reason to disregard research? Yeah, I think it's a really bad way to, re- uh, to disregard research because sometimes the companies might get it right. And I think just out of pocket disregarding it is a mistake. The best way to look at the research is to look at uh, where it's published. Is it peer-reviewed or just a website? And is it in a good journal, not just another fly-by-night predatory journal, which are becoming quite confusing to navigate these days? If it's in a good journal that's been peer-reviewed, are other people replicating that work? And is that work growing? And is it evolving? And is it, are you seeing it expand? The anti-GMO literature is dotted with, or not just dotted, paved <laughs> with really poor quality reports. And they're poor quality reports that are published once and then never expanded. So the great example is the Seralini, you know, lumpy rat paper from 2012. That's six years old now. And means the work was done seven years ago and then maybe a year to publish it. And no one else has repeated that work. And it tells you that that was really a dead end. But look at the harm that report did. Uh, Kenya stopped uh, pursuing genetic engineering because of that report. And uh, even today is still very limited in how they approach it because they're so afraid based upon that report that never replicated. So replicated expanding science in peer-reviewed journals, that's the best way to vet whether something has merit or not. Now, that... That study that you mentioned with the rats and, and Kenya not exploring that, that model. Now, can you just give folks a really quick background on that for the folks that haven't heard about it? 
Sure. So this was in in uh, September of 2012. A paper came out from France, which claimed that genetically engineered uh, that well uh, corn from genetically engineered plants and the herbicide Roundup, which is glyphosate, the stuff I mentioned earlier, that they caused these huge tumors in rats. And the pictures were disgusting. They were uh, grotesque pictures of rats that scared people really badly. And uh, the problem was the scientific community immediately looked at this paper and said, this is garbage. They tested 10 rats in each section, and the controls got tumors too, but they didn't show that picture. <laughs> um, not, not so good. But that became an iconic image, and it's emblematic of the movement. And if you were to uh, Google GMO rats, you'll see those pictures everywhere today. The paper was retracted and eventually republished somewhere else in a really poor quality journal, um, but most of all, never replicated since. Right, and it's kind of unfortunate because when a paper like that is retracted, you know, the damage is sort of done already, you know, especially from a media standpoint. And they, people don't hear about the retraction. That's right. Um, that's right. And, and, it was, and it was within hours that countries like Kenya said, we are going to suspend all of our genetic engineering uh, efforts and not allow them to be approved. And they just started letting that door crack open again. And I mentioned Kenya specifically because that part of the world is really close to my heart in terms of where this technology could have its greatest impacts, uh, whether it's just from those conventional traits we talked about before, but also ways of fighting um, maize necrotic virus, um, fall armyworm, which is going to be a huge problem on the African continent, um, vitamin A deficiency, where we can make crops that are um, a high in beta carotene, this orange stuff in carrots, that could help alleviate um, suffering from blindness and premature death. Um, so many different traits that scientists and universities have figured out that are to be given away for free and uh, distributed any way you want. Yet those countries are not approving them because of fear that's caused by uh, issues like that one paper with the lumpy rats. Right. Now, being as knowledgeable on this topic as you are, Kevin, I think it'll be helpful for folks to know how you eat and shop. So do you focus on buying local and organic or like how does your shopping cart look and what are you thinking about when you're you're doing a grocery shop? Well, I'm kind of a tricky example because I'm you know, I'm 51 years old, but i am uh, been an athlete my entire life. I was nationally competitive for a long time in a variety of sports and still run a lot and still take care of myself. So what, what I do if, if when I worry, and I do worry about food, and I think about food all the time, most of the stuff I eat is out of my garden. I got a great garden that has stuff twice a year that is really the centerpiece of what I produce. I have eggs and ducks or chickens and ducks, so I eat a lot of eggs. But I go to the grocery store, I spend time around the edge, and I buy conventional produce. It's no problem. And I buy meat, no problem. Not Don't have to buy anything special like you know organic or pasture-raised or anything. I don't care. It's all raised well, in my opinion, and responsibly, in my opinion. If I get a chance to go to the farmer's market, I go on Saturday morning usually, and I buy whoever has something I like. And I love supporting a local farmer, whether it's organic or conventional. And it's mostly around keeping people in business that I appreciate their ethics and the fact they're out, you know, on a cold Florida Saturday morning. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, they'll be out there every Saturday, rain or shine. Um, and I support that. And I like supporting diverse voices in agriculture. And um, so any, anybody, who's got any, anybody who's got something weird, like some unusual melon that they were able to culture, I'll, I'll pay 10 bucks for it just to go try it. So I, I, I'm all for all kinds of agriculture and farmers supporting the choices f- to be able to produce what they want to produce in the way they want to produce it to satisfy their markets. Very cool, man. Now, as we start to wrap up here, is there anything that we didn't touch on or chat about today that you'd like to mention? Or are there any specific ideas or messages you'd kind of like to leave folks with around this topic? Yeah, I think the really important one is, is that a lot of people do have concerns and that they may feel like, well, I'm just uncomfortable with uh, moving DNA and moving genes and you know, all this stuff. No matter what the scientists say, I'm still uncomfortable about that. But keep that, and that's great. And if you live in the EU or you live in the U.S. and you got plenty of money to spend on whatever, go for it. 
But keep in mind that when we talk about technology in a negative light and say, well, I don't like this and I think it's dangerous or you know whatever, keep in mind that that could have impacts someplace very far from us. And when you go to places like Africa, you, especially I was in Uganda last year, and you can see the devastation of bacterial wilts that we have solutions for. Um, but the Ugandan government will not adapt, adopt new policies to solve that problem because they believe, well, if it's not good enough for the U.S. and EU, why should we have this technology? Yet there are people there that do need it. And it's technology that's made by Ugandans and by Kenyans, uh, uh, African groups that have um, engineered these plants. It's not Monsanto and Bayer. So when we make the choices we make and when we talk about it or we subscribe to those bad documentaries and the bad, uh, you know, lazy uh, um, books and websites, it does have a profound impact on the global food security of people who are desperately in need of more calories and better quality calories. So that's the most important message. Make your choices, but think about how your choices and your words affect the choices for others. What a great way to wrap things up, man. Now, can you let folks know where they can find out more about you and your work? Sure. Um, best place to go is uh, to uh, kevinfolta.com is my um, is my um, website. But if you go to, uh, I'm on Twitter, at Kevin Folta, and also host the Talking Biotech, webs, uh, Talking Biotech podcast uh, at, uh, on iTunes or anywhere else, talkingbiotechpodcast.com. We discuss one of these traits and one of these applications every week, but we are mostly interested in sustainability and how they play into uh, more sustainable profits for farmers, how they help the environment, or how they can help the world's needy. And we talk a ton about crop domestication and where crops came from in time and space, not just genetic engineering, but uh, genetics, and a lot of very interesting stuff. And I keep it uh, reasonable for the average listener. So after they listen to N1, they can get, <laughs> maybe tune into Talking Biotech. Yeah, and I've listened to your podcast personally, and I really enjoy it. So I'll definitely link to all that stuff in the show notes. And thanks so much for taking the time to chat with us and educating us on this topic. Oh, anytime. There's tons more. So anytime we can talk, I'd love to take on more. So just let me know. I'll take you up on that, man. Thanks so much again, and I'll catch you guys on the next episode.